OK, so I'm trying something new this semester. Um, since if you can see the words on the bottom, then uh, we might do this every class. Uh, and I will also be recording this and uploading it to uh, YouTube. Uh, and the reason I'm uploading it to YouTube is because if you uh, watch a, an English video in YouTube, uh, you can actually turn on, uh, not only can you turn on automatic captions, you can also search those captions. So for example, I opened up uh, a past course that I did in English. Uh, so I did this in English. So if you go click here, settings, no, not settings, uh, here, these three dots, uh, you can open captions. And if you open captions, then you can also search for captions. Oh, let's see, control F. Right, so if you're looking for a word, you can find it in uh, the record. Uh, so if you ever need to rewatch a course, this should help you. Okay, uh, so let's begin our course. Um, so this course, Introduction to Western Literature, will be a little bit different from last semester's Approaches to Literature. Approaches to Literature is a skills-based course, which means that the point of that course uh, is for you to learn how to do something. And that something, hopefully, is uh, to understand literature, or at least uh, have an idea of how to read literature with your brain turned on, I like to say. Starting from this semester, your literature courses will be knowledge-based, which means that you will have to learn something about what we read. Um, so in this course, we're going to be reading some of the most important classics of Western literature. Uh, and almost everything we read this semester will be in translation into English. The original language is not English because uh, England was not a very important place until very late in uh, human history. Uh, most of what we're going to be reading is in Greek, ancient Greek. So let me show you the syllabus. Uh, this is the weekly schedule here. Let me. So uh, first week, introduction. Next week, holiday. We have too many holidays on Monday this semester. Uh, the first two things we're going to be reading are the Homeric epics. Uh, these are the oldest, complete, uh, important works of literature uh, in the Western world. Uh, the, the, they're called Homeric epics because they are supposedly uh, collected, edited by a guy named Homer. I'll talk about that a bit more later. Um, there's a lot of debate about this. The first thing we're going to be reading is the Iliad. Uh, I have heard this translated into Chinese as Mu Ma Tu Chen Ji, but that's not quite true because the story of the Trojan horse happens after the Iliad ends. So it's not part of the story. Um, the Iliad does talk about the Trojan War, but it's not the story of the war. It's the story of one thing that happens in this 20, sorry, 10 year long war. Uh, it begins in year nine. Uh, so it's only about a very small part, but it's a very important part of the war. Um, and we're not going to be reading all of it because all of it is 24 books. Uh, we're only going to be spending two weeks. Uh, on week three, we will read selections from book six. And we will read all of book 16. 
for week four, uh, you will read all of book 22 and uh, a selection from book 24. Uh, these are. They you could say they're the more important parts. You can also say they are the more interesting parts. Um, and uh, don't worry too much about like how much you have to read. It's only around uh, 20 pages per week. It, and it's in modern English because these are translated. St uh, starting from week five, we'll be reading the second Homeric epic, the Odyssey. And usually that's just translated as Odyssey. The Odyssey is the story of one of the Greek heroes from the Trojan War, Odysseus. Uh, they fought the war for 10 years, and it took Odysseus another 10 years to get home. So the Odyssey is the story of what happens to him in those 10 years. Now again, there are 24 books, so we're not going to read all of it. We're going to be reading a bit more than the Iliad because the Odyssey is much more interesting. Uh, we're going to be reading on week five, we're going to read book 10. Before week six, you're going to read book 11 and the beginning of book 12. Week seven is another holiday. Week eight, you're going to be reading uh, all of book 16. Uh, and similar to last semester, we're not going to be doing a coordinated midterm exam. Uh, you will have a take home exam. Uh, this time I'm not going to give you something new to read. The exam will be about what we have discussed in class. Um, week nine midterms, we don't have a class. Week 10, you guys will still be recovering from midterms, so we can watch a movie. Uh, the movie is Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? directed by the Cohen brothers, Ke and Shongdi, if you know about these things. Uh, and it is probably the most famous movie adaptation of the Odyssey. It is not the Odyssey. It is a story based on the Odyssey, starring George Clooney. Week 11, this week will be the only thing that is modern literature this semester. Uh, Zachary Mason wrote a short story collection called The Lost Books of the Odyssey. Um, I'll, I'll introduce this later in the semester, but the idea is that um, each story is based on a character or event from the Trojan War or from the Odyssey. Uh, so we will be reading four of these stories. Uh, they're very short, so don't worry. So like uh, story 12 and 14 are both less than one page long. Uh, so this should not take too much time. And we can talk about um, what exactly is so important about the Iliad and the Odyssey that someone today would still want to draw from these stories to make new literature. Week 12, uh, we will move on to a different part of ancient Greek literature, the Metamorphoses, Bianxingji, not the one by Kafka. This is the original one. Ovid was not Greek. Ovid was Roman, so he wasn't writing in Greek. He was writing in Latin. The Metamorphoses are a collection of ancient Greek myths and legends. Uh, basically, all the stories that have to do with the gods or heroes uh, in ancient Greek culture. And we will be reading from only one chapter. Um, each chapter contains more than one story. So we'll be reading, how many was it? Two, three stories? Um, week 12, uh, sorry, week 11 and week 12 together are one unit. This unit is about myths, senhua. What is a myth? Why are they important? That might appear on the final exam. Starting week 13, we will leave behind um, like Greek legends and, and gods and myths, and we'll move into more uh, human literature. Weeks 13 to 15, we will be reading all of 
the most famous ancient Greek tragedy, um, Oedipus Tyrannos, otherwise known as Oedipus the King. Uh, this is a story of Oedipus, who is a Greek king, and the terrible shit that happens to him. It's a tragedy, right? It's a tragic play. Aristotle, Yari Sudoda, called this the best ancient Greek tragedy. So if we have to read one, we're probably we should probably read this one. Um, I should tell you that the file on Moodle for Oedipus Tyrannos is not the final one. Uh, the translation that I have is kind of difficult. So I'm trying to track down an easier translation, but it's not here yet. Uh, the library tells me it should be here before week 13. So if it arrives before week 13, I will update everything uh, and we'll use the easier translation. If it doesn't arrive before week 13, good luck. Uh, I'll try to help you as much as I can. Uh, so that's 13 to 15. Week 16 and 17, we're going to leave behind the Greeks and the Romans, and we're going to talk about the other important source of Western literature, Christianity, Jidu Jiao. Week 16, we will be reading selections from the Hebrew Bible, otherwise known as the Old Testament, Jiu Ri. We're going to be reading from Genesis, Chuang Siji, and a little bit from Exodus, Chu Ai Ji Ji. Week 17, we're therefore going to read the other part of the Bible, the New Testament, Xing Ri, uh, the Christian Bible. And the Christian Bible, uh, it's basically four biographies of Jesus, and then everything else is uh, like uh, St. Paul spreading the good word of Christianity to everywhere around the world. That part is kind of boring. So we're going to read from uh, the story of Jesus, um, the Gospels of Luke and Matthew specifically. I think this is Lu uh, Jia Fuying and Ma Tai Fuying, something like that. And then at the end of week 17, there will be your uh, a take home final exam about Oedipus, the myths and the Bible. And so that's what we're going to be doing this semester. Questions? OK, um, so let's take a look at the Moodle page. Uh, so first of all, similar to the logic of me doing this with the screen, I've put everything that you might need online already. Uh, we changed the classroom. I'm glad you found it. My email. This email is not the same thing that Moodle gives you. If you look up my profile on Moodle and there's an email there, that email does not work. Don't send your email there. Send your email to this web address. Uh, my office, um, if you want to come chat, uh, please email me first. And uh, if your friend or, you know, someone wants to add to this course and they, they want to join the Microsoft Teams, that's the code. Syllabus, we just looked at this. Class emails, if I send you a class email, the record will be here. Attendance, you can't see this, but this is where I will post your attendance grade at the end of the semester. This file, Edith Hamilton 1942 Mythology, this is a book. This is a very important book. Um, we won't have time to talk about the entire Trojan War. We won't have time to talk about all 10 years that it, uh, that Odysseus was trying to get home. So if you want the full story, it's all here in this book. Uh, and this is much, much, much shorter than going off to read the entire Iliad or the entire Odyssey. Um, like she tells the Trojan War in, I think, one or two chapters. One chapter is up to the end of the Iliad, from the beginning of the war all the way to the end of the Iliad. And the second chapter is about the end of the war. So that's the entire 10-year Trojan War. 
Uh, and she tells the 10 years of Odysseus also in 1.2 chapters. Like most of the story is in one chapter. And then there's a tiny bit of the story that she puts in another chapter for some reason. So it's all there. Um, also for the Metamorphoses by Ovid, right? All of those Greek myths and legends, gods and goddesses, everything is in this book. Uh, so if you need, if you're lost and you you need to find out what's going on, you can check this book. Uh, and this is where I should warn you. As this YouTuber says, if you haven't read what we're doing in class, you absolutely need to read it before coming to class. Otherwise, none of this will make sense. So please do the reading before coming to class. Uh, okay, so the first unit, the Iliad, the PDF of all that we will be reading is here. Week, the questions for week three and week four. Same logic, the Odyssey, uh, and then the questions for weeks five, six, and eight. The myths and adaptations, the lost books of the Odyssey, the four stories we're going to be reading and the questions. And then the part of the metamorphoses we'll be reading and the questions. Uh, again, the Oedipus files are not the latest, but if you want to take a peek, you can uh, look at them already if you want. Uh, the story of Oedipus is also in uh, that book um, mythology. Uh, so if you get lost in the play, you can also check the book. And then the last unit, the Bible. So the mythology book does not talk about the Bible. So I have uploaded also two introductions. The introductions are taken from the same book that I took the readings, but I'm not going to pass out paper copies of the introduction because you technically don't have to read them. They may help you. Uh, and if you're curious, you can learn a bit more from these introductions, um, but they're not necessary. So I won't give you a paper copy. Uh, but the Hebrew Bible and the Christian Bible are both in the same file, right? The file that says the Bible. And then you have questions for week 16 and week 17. And then the exams are at the bottom as usual. So this is the uh, Moodle page. Questions? OK, there's one thing I have to talk to you about. Uh, and it is the the grades if you look at the system the course system it doesn't look like this the course system says daily grade 60 percent midterm 20 percent final 20 percent um so here's how we're going to do this um the participation 20 percent this uh, sorry, the, the final grade, the final exam, 40%, that will be the same. Sixty. Hang on. Hang on. Six, my math is not very good. Hang on. 60, 20, 20. Okay, so uh, the participation grade, 20%, will be recorded on the course system as your final exam grade, 20%. The number is the same. But the exam grades uh, for the midterm 20%, that will be one half of your midterm grade because the midterm is actually 40%. So if you get a full score on your midterm, if you get 40, I will record your grade as 20 
and then the other 20 will be moved to the participation grade on the website that is 60%. Okay, I, I think I may need to draw this on the board. Okay, so um, let's see. So this is how we are actually going to record your scores. This is what it looks like on the system. So uh, sorry, that's not right. It's this is what it looks like on the system, right? So this is this is your uh, midterms. This is your finals, and then this is your daily grade. So these two will be recorded at the same time, right? At the end of the semester. So uh, your daily, your final grade will actually be your participation grade. Now your midterm grade half will be recorded here and then half will be recorded here and uh that's that's not your mid that's your final sorry half will be recorded here half will be recorded here uh, and then your final grade will be recorded here does that make sense I'm I'm moving the numbers around. Uh, as long as they both add up to 100, uh, you should get the same final grade for the entire semester. The idea is I'm cutting your midterm grade in half. One half will be recorded as your midterm grade. The other half will be added to your final exam and recorded as your daily grade and uh, your daily grade will be recorded as your final grade, a uh, final exam. So is that clear? So if on your midterm you get more than 20 points, you will get 20 on your midterm and then the rest of the points will be added to your uh, daily grade. If you're on your midterm, you get less than 20. Uh, you your entire midterm score will be recorded as the midterm. OK, if you have questions, please ask me during the break. Um, yeah. OK, so that is the introduction to the course. Questions? OK, uh, so let's talk about what we're going to be doing in two weeks, which is we were going to start reading the Iliad. And so this is when I pass out the handout.
有没有多的或少的Okay, as you can tell, I have lots of extras. So if you want another copy or you want to give it as a Valentine's Day gift or whatever, you can ask for another one. Um, this is two weeks of reading. The, this is all of the Iliad that we are going to read in this class. Um, and as you can tell, it's in modern English. Uh, OK, so very briefly, this is what's going on in the Iliad. Uh, according to. This is what's going on in the Trojan War, the entire war. So one day, uh, Eris, the goddess of discord, Fen Luan, walks into Olympus uh, and she throws down a golden apple. And on the apple is written to the fairest. So the three main goddesses on Olympus start to fight over the apple. The first goddess is Athena, Yadina, the goddess of practical wisdom. So uh, her um, area is like practical life skills, how to do things. Uh, the second goddess is Aphrodite the goddess of beauty. The third goddess is Hera, the goddess of marriage. Hera is also the wife of Zeus, so, she, so she's like the most important goddess. So the three goddesses are arguing who should get the apple, uh, and they decide to go and ask uh, some dude on Earth named Paris. Paris is the most handsome man in ancient Greece. So they go and they find Paris and they ask him, uh, who do you think deserves this golden apple? But of course, it's not that simple. Each goddess tries to bribe him. Um, Hera promises him power. Athena promises him glory in battle. And Aphrodite promises him the most beautiful woman in all of Greece. He chooses Aphrodite, and so Aphrodite brings him to uh, a woman named Helen. Helen at the time was already married to uh, a king named Menelaus. But you know, she's a goddess, so she helps Paris, who's very handsome, to seduce Helen, and Paris brings Helen back with him home. Where does Paris live? He lives in Troy, Taloi. Uh, so if you, if, do you know the geography of ancient Greece? No? Okay. Imagine the Mediterranean Sea, Dizonghai. On this end is Spain and Morocco, and the, like this is the Atlantic Ocean. And then you have the Mediterranean, and near the end over here, first you have Italy, right, a boot. And then you have like a collection of islands, and this is Greece. At the end of the Mediterranean, you have Asia Minor, Shia, and Troy is on Asia Minor. So if you look at the entire Mediterranean Sea, it's not very far. But this was a long, long time ago. This was before uh, mankind built huge ships to sail the sea. So to the Greeks, this was very far from Greece to Troy. OK, so uh, Paris seduced Helen. So Menelaus, of course, is very angry, right? He was married to the most beautiful woman in Greece and now a goddess and this handsome young man stole her from him. How dare they? So he calls on all of the other kings of Greece. 
Greece at the time is is like little cities. It's not like one country, like little city states. 一个一个小城邦 So he calls on all of the kings of Greece. When Menelaus first married Helen, because she was so beautiful, every man wanted to marry her. So they agreed that whomever Helen chose, everybody else. Not only did everybody have to agree, everybody had to defend their marriage. So, like, if one of the other Greeks decided to steal Helen, they would all have to fight that guy. Nobody thought that someone from Troy would come to steal Helen, but they had made this agreement. So Menelaus called on all the all the other kings of Greece and called upon them to go fight Troy to to bring Helen back, and that's the beginning of the Trojan War. For a woman, but it's it, she was a beautiful woman.、Uh, the Renaissance English poet Christopher Marlowe called her the face that launched a thousand ships. That's how beautiful she was. So, anyways, they go to Troy,、um, and Troy is like on near the beach, right? It's near the water because it's an ancient city. People need water. And they fight for nine years. Troy is a very well defended city. It's hard to take,、uh, so the Greeks were not able to take Troy, even though they brought basically all of their armies together.、Uh, in in the second book of the Iliad, there is a list of everybody that went to the Trojan War. It takes up the entire second book. That's how many people went, but still they couldn't win after nine years. And that is where the story of the Iliad begins in year nine. The story of the Iliad is only one part of the war, but it's a very important part. It is the part of the war where the Greeks start to win. But before they start to win, they first have to start to lose. So it begins with the anger of Achilles. Achilles is the best fighter among the Greeks. Uh, the, he is born of human on the one side and goddess on the other, so like he can't be killed.、Uh, he's the fastest, he's the strongest, but he's also very prideful and jaw all. So at the beginning of the Iliad, their commander Agamemnon,、uh, for a complicated reason, takes one of the women that Achilles had won in battle. So again, this is ancient Greece. There was no gender equality.、Uh, it was basically like uh, if uh, a woman was captured in battle, she basically became like a a, a female slave or concubine.、Uh, so like、uh, Agamemnon took one of the women that Achilles won in battle, and Achilles is like really pissed off. He's like. Okay, so you have to take one woman. Why did you have to take it from me? Why not anybody else? Why didn't you give away one of your women? Like, why? Are, why are you doing this to me? And so he said, "You know what? Until you apologize, I'm not going to fight."、Uh, and so, like, the first two thirds of the Iliad is the story of、uh, how the Greeks try to keep fighting without their best fighter, and it doesn't go very well, as you can imagine. Another reason why it doesn't go very well is because this is not just a war between humans; it is also a war between the gods. Three of the gods are on one side; three of the gods are on the other. And not only do the gods fight, they also help specific human warriors that they like. So,、uh, in, during battle, if suddenly one warrior starts like killing everybody, and he's like really like. Empowered and he's like making headway along the battle.、Uh, the Greeks would say that some god or goddess is helping this person, and so this is not the time to fight him because I cannot beat a god. So, like the first two thirds of the Iliad is just like the different gods and goddesses like pushing the battle this way and that way and this way and that way. It's on the one hand, it's kind of boring. But on the other hand, every time someone dies, it's very detailed. Like it'll say, like the spear went through his chest and poked out his back and took out his brains, something like that.、Um, it's it's a story of a war. 
But because those parts are not very interesting, we're going to skip those parts. Uh, book six, which we're going to read first, is not actually about a battle. It is about something that happens inside Troy. Um, so on the Greek side, the most powerful fighter is Achilles. On the Trojan side, the most powerful fighter is named Hector. And fate has it that uh, Hector will be killed one day by Achilles. But after Achilles kills Hector, he too will die. So in order for the war to end, both of these men have to die. Um, and they both know this because it's ancient Greece. Everybody knows what the gods are thinking for some reason. So book six is about Hector uh, convincing Paris. Remember the dude who stole Helen, convincing Paris to leave his house and actually join the fight. Uh, and then he goes to meet his, uh, Hector goes to meet his family before going back out to fight. It's a it's a family portrait. It's a picture of a family um, before the terror of war. So that's what we're going to be reading before next week. Uh, the Iliad ends after uh, Hector dies, a little bit after Hector dies. So we don't see the death of Achilles. We don't see Odysseus building the Trojan horse, uh, and we don't see the fall of Troy. But because fate has decreed that both Hector and Achilles must die, when Hector dies, it is the beginning of the end of the war. So that's the basic story of the Trojan War and the Iliad. If you want more details, uh, you can read the mythology book. Um, we should also talk about what kind of story we are going to read. This is not like a novel you would read today, right? It's an old piece of literature, and it's also an oral literature, Shu Wenshu. So we, we say that this was like written by Homer, but he didn't really write it. Uh, at most, he probably collected all the different versions of the poem and put them together into something that makes sense. And we know this because uh, people who know Greek, who know ancient Greek, when they read the original poem, the language does not come from the same period in history. Some parts are older, some parts are newer, some parts are from this part of Greece, some parts are from that part of Greece. It's a collection. Uh, and we also know that it's oral literature because in antiquity, many different sources mention different versions of the poem. We don't have those versions. We only have the version that Homer collected for us. Uh, in ancient Greece, oral literature is a kind of uh, performance, and it's also a kind of uh, payment, I guess. It's a service. Um, Oral literature is performed, was performed by uh, what are called bards in Chinese, ying you shi ren. Their job basically was to memorize the stories that their teacher taught them and to go around Greece and entertain and perform for the different parts of Greece. And this is how the Greeks uh, remembered their history. This was before uh, the Greeks had a system of writing. So everything that they knew, they had to keep in their own heads. Uh, and so the way that they remembered so much history is through poetry. Poetry, of course, is much easier to remember than prose, Sanwenti. Uh, if you remember from high school days, uh, your Chinese teacher would want you to memorize poems, but not like essays, Sanwen because poems are written to be remembered. Uh, they, that's why they have things like meter, gelu, uh, sorry, jiezo, gelu. Yeah, same thing, gelu. Uh, and rhyme, ya ring. In the ancient Greek, the Iliad and the Odyssey feel like poems, right? They're very uh, carefully structured uh, so that 
the bard, uh, when the bard starts to forget something, they can make up something similar that fits into the structure of the poem. Um, but because we're reading it in English, uh, it may not feel like a poem, depending on which translation you use. Over the years, of course, there have been many, many, many different translations. Um, this translation is not so strict about the poetry part. It's more careful about uh, being understandable and clear. Uh, bards were usually blind, so they weren't just in Yosirin, how is it Mangren in Yosirin? Homer apparently was one of these bards who either he learned how to write or he found someone who knew how to write. Uh, and that's how they recorded the Iliad and the Odyssey. Or maybe Homer is just a name for whoever did these things. Maybe it, Homer is not just one person. Maybe the Iliad had one uh, recorder and the Odyssey had another recorder. Maybe it was a group of people and they used the name Homer as a kind of uh, sign for the author. The truth is nobody knows. Uh, but from the earliest history, people have said that these poems were by Homer or collected by Homer. Uh, so that's what we have continued to do up to this day. OK, so do you have questions about the Iliad? It's called the Iliad because uh, the city of Troy it was also known as the city of Ilium. So the Iliad is the Song of Troy. Basically, that's what it means. Uh, and so like in the poem, sometimes it will mention a god or a goddess. And if you're not sure uh, who this god or goddess is, what they do, what they're about, um, you can also look into that book, Mythology. Um, at the beginning, Hamilton uh, introduces all of the important gods and goddesses. The way that the ancient Greeks thought about their gods is different from how we think about our gods today, whether it's the Christian god or like uh, local gods that you might pray to, like like Wensangdring or something like that. Um, the Greeks had an idea of gods as like um, physical beings, like they looked like people. But uh, if a god uh, interacts with a human, you usually don't see a god. You usually see a person. And in the poem, sometimes it will say, uh, like this god took the form of this person to speak to that person. And in the middle of their conversation, that person realized that they were actually talking to a god. Uh, because to the ancient Greeks, a god, even though they gave their gods uh, like a human form, when they mention a god, what they were really thinking about is the effect of the god. So a famous example is uh, somewhere in the Iliad, Achilles is about to kill or about to fight one of his, uh, uh, one of the warriors on the same side, right? He's angry, he wants to fight somebody. But at the last moment, he realizes that this is not the best way to get what he wants. And the poem says that Athena came to him, Yadina, right? The goddess of practical wisdom. Because at that moment, he's trying to do something. He's trying to achieve some kind of goal. Uh, so the feeling that this is not the way to do it, that feeling itself is the goddess Athena. You don't have to see her. You don't have to feel, uh, you don't have to imagine her, but when the change suddenly happens inside you, the Greeks would say, oh, a god did that to you. Uh, and so that's why we rarely see a god actually directly interacting with a human. Usually it's either through a, a feeling or through some other person. Uh, so you can keep that in mind as we read. Let's take a short break.
next week I will divide you into groups so that you will be better able to discuss the questions. Now, last semester, as I'm sure you remember, uh, was very chaotic because of the pandemic. Um, and like the first week, half of you were not able to follow along with what was happening. Usually in the first semester, uh, especially for freshmen, I will give a short lecture about like things you can do or pay attention to to help you survive the English department. Um, but I guess like at least half of you didn't catch that part. So over the winter break, I organized this lecture into a more detailed PowerPoint. Uh, and so let me share that with you now. Uh, and so we can, I'll give you some tips about um, like how to survive the English department. If I can share this PowerPoint, hang on. Yay, okay. No. This one. <sighs> okay, one moment. This is very annoying. I want to hit the X. Why isn't... Uh, okay, fine, whatever. No! Where did I put it? There, okay. Okay, yeah, okay, whatever. Things to keep in mind in an English department. The first, of course, is that most things will be done in English. And so if your English was not very good uh, at the beginning, you're going to have to catch up. But how is the best way to learn English? Uh, most of you uh, studied your textbooks very hard and like other like reference books throughout your six to 12 years of studying English uh, in your life up to now. Uh, so if it has not been working for you up to this point, maybe you can try something different. The thing about English is that it's actually one of the hardest languages to learn. Not because it has so many rules, but because so many parts of English don't follow the rules. There are so many exceptions. English, because it is a global language, it means that uh, so many different people from so many different cultures all try to use English. And when they try to use English, English changes for each person. So as I'm sure you know, like when you talk to a Taiwanese person in English, it can be very different from talking to a Japanese person in English or talking to an American in English. English changes for each person. So what is the correct English? English is unlike most languages or many languages in the world. In Chinese, if you want to look up the correct language, you would go to the official Ministry of Education dictionary online. If you want to look up the correct French, you would go look up the uh, dictionary put together by the French Academy. If you want to look up the correct English, you have to check five or six different dictionaries and compare them and see which one makes more sense. This is because English, as it says here, English is a living language. It is not uh, determined, it is not decided by a group of scholars. The correct English is whatever native speakers of English say. Whatever they say, that's correct. So sometimes you will see things that are not technically good English, but because most English speakers do it that way, therefore it becomes the correct English. One very interesting example is, of course, uh, the English phrase, long time no see, 好久不见, right? This entered English because so many Chinese Americans started saying this uh, 
and like native speakers of English could understand this and they thought it was a very useful thing to say. So it became part of correct English, even though like long time is fine, but no C is definitely not correct grammar. That's how language changes. So how do you learn a living language? You have to breathe it. You have to use osmosis. Uh, if, you, if you try to memorize like a, a list of rules for English, you will always come across some exceptions, and these exceptions will be used in daily life. So they're very important to know. So the best way to learn a living language like English is to pay attention to how people use the language. So for example, I, I'm sure you can tell I am a native speaker of English. So whatever English I say is technically correct English. So if you want to like not only learn about literature from me, but also try to improve your English by listening to me, don't just pay attention to what I say. Pay attention to how I say it. When I write an email to you, don't just try to grab the information. Pay attention to how I give you that information. Uh, this is why you had to ha take or you still have to take like English reading. Right, the, the idea of that course is if you read enough English materials written by native speakers, you will observe and learn how they use the language. But this only works if you pay attention to the language part. Not just the information. Uh, so just to take a look at some of those crazy exceptions. Uh, this logic of learning a living language applies both uh, applies to all of English. Vocabulary, yes, pronunciation, yes, but also grammar. This is also how the best way to learn grammar is to pay attention to how native speakers use grammar. So, for example, the grammar example, what in the world does this sentence mean? James didn't gift Dylan an invite because she didn't want them to come. She just forgot. This example has, hang on, one, two, three, four uh, exceptions to rules or like minor rules that you may not know. Uh, so first of all, like what is a noun? What is a verb? It actually, it actually depends on where it is in the sentence and what it is doing. When you go look a, a look up a word in the dictionary, it will tell you like noun or verb, but that is also just the product of observation. It is not a rule. It is an observation. The rule is how are the words used? In this sentence, the word gift is the main verb. The word invite is the main object. So even though if you look at look it up in a dictionary, gift is supposed to be a noun and invite is supposed to be a verb. Depending on where they are in the sentence, the meaning changes. Like in Chinese, we have a name for this, right? We call this ping, but there's not really an, a popular name for this in English because it is so common. Everybody does this every day. The third thing that you may not notice is the pronouns. Which person is she? Which person is them? In this example, James is a woman. And you may think, wait, James is supposed to be a guy's name. But in fact, again, the gender of a name is not a rule. It is an observation. So if you meet a woman and she says, hi, my name's James, that's her name. The them is Dylan. In English, if you don't know the gender of a person, even though it's one person, you can use the word they or them as a pronoun for one person. If you look at the history of English, singular they, danshu they, is actually one of the oldest pronouns in English. 
So like if your composition teacher tells you, no, that's wrong, you can say, no, 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 CJ, our literature professor said that it is the best way. And then I'll get into an argument with that professor. Um, but in everyday life, native speakers do this. And if they don't know the gender of the person, they will use they for one person. Sometimes you will meet a person and they say that they are non-binary, which means they don't, uh, they don't identify as a man or as a woman. They don't have a fixed gender. So if you use he or she for this person, they are not correct. Your only choice is to use they. Now, uh, I chose the name Dylan because Dylan is actually one of those names that uh, used to be an, a guy's name and has slowly turned into a girl's name. That's not right. It's one of those names that used to be a girl's name and has slowly turned into a guy's name. At this point, basically, if you if you meet someone online and there's no picture and they say, hi, my name's Dylan, you really don't know. It's equally popular for uh, both uh, men and women at this point. The fourth rule in this sentence that you may not know is using the word because. James didn't give Dylan an invite because she didn't want them to come. If you translate that in this order into Chinese, it, it would be something like, uh, but that's not true. That's why I added the second sentence. She just forgot. So the correct translation should be, in English, if you have the word not, right, didn't, right, not, and the word because in the same sentence, what gets canceled is the because. The reason gets canceled. The thing still happens, but the reason is no longer true. Unless you add a comma before the because. 如果在because前面加逗点, so these are some things that if you really pay close attention to what you read, uh, hopefully you may observe. The same thing goes for vocabulary. This is a famous nonsense poem from uh, Lewis Carroll uh, from Alice in Wonderland. Uh, the Jabberwock with eyes of flame came whiffling through the Tolgi wood and burbled as it came. Three of these words, four of these words, have no meaning. And yet, when a native speaker reads this sentence, they still have a general idea of what this sentence means. And it is because of, uh, not only because of the grammar, like where the word is in the sentence, but also because of the sound of the word and uh, the how the word is spelled, what it looks like and what it feels like. Jabberwock has a capital J, so you know that this is some kind of person or creature, right? The Jabberwock has eyes and it can move, right? It came. Uh, so it's probably like some kind of monster. As it came, it whiffled through the Togi wood. Wood here is a word that means forest. So it came whiffling through the Togi forest. Okay, so whiffling uh, sounds kind of like whistling. It sounds kind of like a sound uh, to describe movement. Togi sounds deeper. It's a deeper sound, right? The U sound, Olgi. Uh, it sounds more like, uh, it sounds darker, it sounds thicker, it sounds uh, unwelcome, not a good kind of forest that you want to be in. And the Jabberwocky also burbled. This is also another sound. Um, and it, it sounds like the word gurgled, which is uh, like when you, when you drink some water and before you swallow it, you go, right, that sound. 
Uh, so even though you don't really know the meaning of these words, even though these words have no meanings, when you read the sentence and you pay attention to where the words are in the sentence, you pay attention to how they sound, you can still get a general idea of what this sentence, uh, what kind of feeling this sentence is trying to give you. And sometimes when you read something in English, it won't be written in the correct way. It will be written uh, to record the specific sound of a person talking. In other words, a dialect, fang yin. And this is not exactly the same as, as fang yin. In Chinese, uh, when we say dialect, uh, the different dialects of China are actually different languages. The definition of dialect is if A and B can understand each other, it's a dialect. If A and B cannot understand each other, it's a language. Or two languages, right? Two dialects, two languages. So like when we say dialects of Chinese, right? Those are actually different languages because they, they can't understand each other. But uh, in English, uh, dialects actually are understandable if you pay attention to the sound. So this sentence, if you don't read it out loud, you can probably only understand like four words, right? Honey is glad see. That's about it. But if I read it out loud, you may get a better sense of what it means. Lord of mercy, honey, I sure is glad to see my child. Suddenly, you know what she's saying. Uh, this is a uh, black dialect. It's an African-American kind of English. The, the book I took this from, their eyes were watching God. The entire book is written like this. So uh, as I said, English is a living language. There are many different ways that English can appear on the page. If you're not sure what's going on, one strategy is to read it out loud and listen. Pay attention to the sound of what's on the page. Uh, so if you didn't catch that, if you translate this into like correct English, it's supposed to say, Lord of mercy, honey, I sure am glad to see my child. So that's the language part. Hopefully, if you pay close attention to how the language is used, your English can improve uh, quickly. Let's move on to like the courses part. OK, so your English is improving, but you still have to take a lot of courses to graduate. And some of them, maybe most of them, are not very interesting. Or maybe uh, like your composition one teacher and your composition two teacher or three teacher uh, have different rules for how you should write. Like maybe uh, your freshman competition, uh, composition teacher says you can use they to refer to one person, and then your sophomore composition teacher says, no, you can't. What do you do? The thing about uh, learning in college, as I'm sure you know, in, in high school or in middle school, the thing that you're learning should be the same across like all schools, across all of Taiwan because the Ministry of Education has set out a standard uh, that every student must learn and the exams are all the same exams. So the teachers are all supposed to teach the same things. But you know, life is not like that, right? In college, after you leave college, the rules are different wherever you go. In one job, your boss wants you to be here at this time, no excuses or you get fired. In that job, your boss himself isn't there most of the time. As long as you can get the work done, no problems. The rules are different. It's the same in college. Uh, if your freshman composition teacher disagrees with your sophomore composition teacher, just do whatever your current teacher wants you to do. Uh, some people may think, but I'm, I'm trying to learn the same thing, right? I'm trying to learn how to write in English. Which one is correct? Both are correct and neither are correct. To take just this one example of writing, 
if in the future your job is to write something in English, like you're an English writer, like at a newspaper or a magazine, the rules that you follow are whatever your editor says is good. If you switch to a different newspaper and you have a new editor, then you have to follow the new rules. So even in the same subject of English writing, there is no one single standard. So if you find yourself like picking out like the differences between teachers, between courses, uh, it's not going to help you very much. Try to focus on what your teacher in that course wants you to do. And if you have to take a course that you're not interested in, like a literature course, for example, uh, here are some things that you can try. First, why is it not interesting? Is it maybe because the teacher sucks at teaching? Is if you try to learn it by yourself, would you be more interested in what you have to learn? Try to find different ways of uh, learning what the course is supposed to teach you. I freely admit I'm not the best teacher in the world, so if you decide to study on your own uh, and you sleep through class, I'm not going to blame you. I did that also when I was young. Maybe that's why I'm not a good teacher. Um, and if you really, really just don't care about this course or any course, but you have to take it because it, you, if you don't take it, uh, you can't graduate, then the smart thing to do is to figure out the bare minimum. What do you have to do to pass the course and do just that? Um, in this class, the bare minimum is you cannot miss more than five weeks and you have to take both exams. That's it. There are smaller details about the exams. We will talk about that uh, later, but if you only do the bare minimum, then the teacher has no reason to fail you. And this is the least you have to do for a course that you don't care about. And if this is how you want to approach a course, remember to double check your results. Right. Uh, instead of waiting for the professor to tell you what your final grade is, try to figure out your own grade uh, before the final exam to figure out like how much more you need to do. Um, so this can prevent you from like barely failing the course, like getting a 58 or a 57. Right. Uh, it's your grade. It's your credit. It is driven. Right. It's your tuition. Uh, you, you can pay more closer attention to whether or not you're actually getting the grade. Uh, actually, we just talked about this one. Um, so like the rules of of like being in a college classroom. Whether it's in college or in work, if you need to ask for something, it doesn't hurt to be polite. Uh, like if you send an email. Uh, don't just say like hi, Lao Su, watching Jia, and then like end, right? At the least you could do is uh, think about the situation from your professor's point of view. You are probably taking like uh, ten to fifteen classes somewhere around there, uh, and so you are ten to fifteen credits, classes credits. Yeah, so you have to deal with maybe. Uh, 10 to 15 different teachers. I'm teaching four classes with a total of around 200 students. So if you don't tell me who you are, I may not know. If you don't tell me uh, which class you're taking, I may not know. Uh, so it always helps to be polite and try to think about something from the other person's perspective. And I also try to do this. Um, sometimes I fail, uh, but I do try. It, it's I think it's just a basic decency to to be considerate of other people. And then finally, the question of plagiarism or stealing. If you steal money from work, even if you steal just a hundred NT, that's stealing. 
in college, if you steal someone else's words or ideas, not just words, but also specific, clear ideas, even if it's the smallest uh, thing, like one sentence, half a sentence, it's still stealing. It's still plagiarism. So the way to avoid this is to, if you are using someone else's words or ideas, tell me where you got those words or ideas from. Uh, last semester, there were certain limits because I was also trying to prevent you from uh, like copying other people's ideas. I wanted to see what you think uh, based on a surprise piece of literature that you had not read, read before. This semester, the test, uh, the exams will all, they will both be on what we read in class. There's no surprise. Uh, so if you want to look up other people's ideas, you can. But remember to give me the source of where you found these ideas. Or like a certain phrase or a certain sentence. Um, the test for whether it is plagiarism is if I can find where you copied from, then it is plagiarism. And like, if at the end of the semester you want to do something nice for me, you can write down, uh, not just like give me like high score, but also like write down your thoughts about the course at the end of the semester. It's anonymous. I don't know who writes what. Uh, and you can write the good parts and the bad parts. Uh, I, I do care about which parts you think could be improved also. OK, so questions? OK, so next week is a holiday. You therefore you have two weeks to read uh, book six. And I I think I said a little bit of book. There was another book in there somewhere. Yeah, book six. Uh, next week I will divide you into groups. Uh, we will discuss the questions. Um, yeah, I think that's it. OK, so I will be here if you have further questions. Otherwise, see you in two weeks.